Are the artists gone? Good, now I can get back to my crappy drawings and pseudocode. Welcome back to the next episode of Math for Game Dev, the series in which we cover topics in math that are really practical to know for game dev. This episode we'll be covering calculus, which is, I'll just say, the study of curves. For anyone interested in actually learning the nitty gritty instead of my extremely quick and dirty rundown, check out 3 Blue 1 Brown. He has a great calculus series that covers the theory, which I will not be covering. The link to this series is of course in the description as always. I'm also going to assume that since I took off basically two months with my linear algebra video and no one has asked for help, that we're all extremely comfortable with vectors and that you're also familiar with the kinematic equations of motion that we used in the algebra video. And as always, if anything I cover isn't clear, just let me know and I'll do my best to help you out. This episode in particular might be quick on the technicals because, well, if university wasn't terrible for my liver, I would have gone to grad school for this stuff. With that out of the way, let's get down to what we're going to be doing today. Imagine we have some kind of 3D action game with an AI that throws things. Like how the enemy porters will throw these electric javelins at Sam in Hideo Kojima's Death Stranding. Since these things will be using projectile motion, we want to figure out exactly at what angle to launch them in order for them to hit their target, if they can at all. And we'll be using calculus. Now, I think if you're familiar with game development, you'll actually actually quickly get the basic ideas underlying calculus. Let's consider calculating the current velocity of anything in a game. Of course, unlike real life, games happen incrementally, frame by frame, so we can just calculate the speed of whatever by subtracting said object's current position by its position in the previous frame, then dividing that by the time between frames, which we'll call delta time. Now, imagine we're running our game on an impossibly fast computer, so that way delta time shrinks until it is infinitesimally small. Not zero, but practically zero. Since frames would be happening instantaneously, one after another, our measurement of velocity would become smooth. We've just covered two fundamental ideas of calculus. Limits and derivatives. Limits are when a variable approaches but never is a certain number. So in our velocity example, we take the limit of delta time as it approaches zero, and the derivative is the instantaneous rate of change or slope of a curve. In our example, we find the derivative of the position by letting delta time approach zero. I did mean it when I said you'd have to be comfortable with the kinematic equations of motion. A note on names, sometimes the derivative of a function can also be called the function's prime. So the second derivative of a function f can also be called f double prime. Now, going back to our old kinematic equations, we can rewrite them using derivatives. Doing so, we find that velocity at time t is the derivative of the position at time t, and acceleration at time t is the derivative of velocity at time t. And we can of course define acceleration as a derivative of position. We'll get that acceleration at time t is the second derivative of position at time t. Now of course, we can go in the opposite direction. Say we've cached the delta time and velocity of an object each frame, and also its starting position. We can of course add the starting position to the sum of the velocity at each frame multiplied by the time between each frame to figure out its exact position every single frame. Let's once again let the delta time approach zero. As we do so, we get a smooth recreation of where the object is over time. This is the third and final fundamental idea of calculus, integrals or antiderivatives. As we just demonstrated, we can take the integral of a derivative of some function f to get the original function f. But of course, the opposite is true as well. We can take the derivative of an integral to get the original function f. And using integrals, we can once again rewrite the kinematic equations of motion. We find that position at time t is the initial position plus the integral of velocity from zero to t. And velocity at time t is the initial velocity plus the integral of acceleration from zero to time t. Now using calculus, we can in fact derive the position of the height of a projectile over time that we used in the algebra episode. Ultimately, all of calculus boils down to a single theorem, the fundamental theorem of calculus. This theorem formalizes the relationship between integrals and derivatives, which we explored with both of the previous examples. Now, when I use calculus in game dev, 99% of the time I'm using the integral, but the derivative has a vital use. You can use it to find where a curve is flat, 
these flat points usually correspond to maximums or minimums in the curve, which again, looking back at the algebra episode, is how we figured out what time we wanted to solve for to get our maximum jump height. We can in fact do everything in that episode by just using calculus and the kinematic equations of motion. I invite you to try it out yourself. I've included a PDF in the description so you can double check your work. For those of you wondering how I know what the derivative or integral of functions are, the answer is I looked it up and so should you. There are two important techniques that I will cover in the video because they're as simple as they are important. First, the power rule which I've written out below. As the name implies, you use this when a variable is raised to a power. And don't forget, x by itself is x raised to the first power. Second, the chain rule. I've written it out below. As you can see, it states that the derivative of a composite function, that is a function g within another function f, is the product of g composed with the derivative of f and the derivative of g. And since the fundamental theorem of calculus details the back and forth relationship between derivatives and integrals, since since we can use these for derivatives, we can also use them for integrals. Now that we've rushed through calculus, let's get down to brass tacks. How to find the launch directions for projectiles in order for them to travel a certain distance. Let's get the easy stuff out of the way. Which horizontal direction should the projectile be launched? If you remember linear algebra, it should be pretty simple. Find the vector between the NPC and its target, zero out any vertical component, then normalize the resultant vector. We're gonna save this for later. Now, onto the good stuff. What's the vertical release angle the projectile should be fired at? I'm going to consider a simple case and leave more complicated stuff to you. Let's assume that the projectile's release elevation and target elevation are level, that there are no obstructing obstacles between them, that the projectile will always be launched with a fixed speed regardless of angle, and that there's no air friction. With this setup, we want to know 1. If the target can be hit, and if so, 2. What release angle should the projectile be launched in order to hit the target? So, first part of the problem. The question here can be written out as, given a projectile speed of some constant k, what release angle will maximize the horizontal distance it can travel? The most important part of this problem is that it's actually two-dimensional, both horizontal and vertical. So we will have to rewrite our kinematic equations to reflect this. And since I want to maximize the horizontal distance traveled, we're just interested at how far it is at the very end of its flight. So we'll call the total time capital T and the total distance capital D. What's important to note here is that since projectile speed is some constant k, regardless of release angle, we can use trigonometry to rewrite v0 as k cosine theta, k sine theta, where theta is our release angle. And since we're ignoring air friction, we can rewrite the horizontal component of velocity to just v sub x at time t is equal to k times cosine theta. Now, let's just solve the integral for position and see what we get. Doing so, you find that d is equal to k capital T cosine theta and 0 is equal to k capital T sine theta minus capital T squared times g divided by 2. We can use the second equation to solve for capital T which will then let us make capital D a function of theta alone. After solving for capital T then plugging it into our first equation, we find that capital D of theta is equal to 2 times g times k squared times cosine theta times sine theta. Using the double angle formula, we can simplify 2 times cosine theta times sine theta to just sine of 2 theta, giving us capital D of theta is equal to g times k squared times sine of 2 times theta. Now, of course, we can get the derivative of capital D with respect to theta to find its maximum. We find that capital D prime of theta is equal to 2g times k squared times k 
cosine of 2 times theta. Due to the problem itself, we will limit theta to 0 through pi over 2 for the obvious reason that we don't want to launch the projectile backwards or straight into the ground. Since we are intimately familiar with the graph of cosine, we know that cosine of theta crosses the horizontal axis at theta is equal to pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 for theta bound from 0 to 2 pi. Thus, cosine of 2 times theta will cross it at theta is equal to pi over 4 for theta from 0 to pi over 2. Plugging that in, we get the following. Furthermore, we know it's the maximum instead of a minimum because before pi over 4, cosine 2 theta is positive and afterwards it is negative, meaning that d of theta will go from increasing to decreasing. I leave it for you as some fun algebra practice to find the formula to set the speed k given just a maximum distance of d. Now for the second part, given that the target is of course within the maximum projectile distance, we can just use some easy peasy trigonometry to find the release angle theta is equal to half of arc sine of d divided by g times k squared for some d less than the maximum distance. Those of you who are real big brains will realize that we should actually get two thetas since arc sine of two times theta will just return values from negative pi over four to positive pi over four. And we've defined the acceptable angles to zero to pi over two. So we'll get another acceptable solution that's pi over two minus theta. Just pick whichever one makes sense to you, either the one above or below pi over four. Now we have the elevation angle and the horizontal direction we want the projectile to be launched. So let's just tie it all together into a single three-dimensional unit vector. And this is actually a lot easier than you might think. So if you wanna try solving it for yourself, pause the video now. So, if you remember the trig video, after we found the angles we wanted to shoot the bullets at, we converted back to unit vectors by taking the cosine and sine of the angles. And we're just going to do the exact same thing here. And as you can see, it's that simple. The normal direction to launch the projectile is the following. As you can see, we've really combined a bunch of previous topics into this one. Hopefully, you see what I said in the series overview video about math building upon itself, but we still approach this problem just like all of the other ones. We first figured out what we want at the end and what we have at the start. Then we used math, now calculus, trigonometry, and some light linear algebra to figure out how to get what we want out of what we have. Now that we have calculus under our belt, we've covered essentially all math needed for every Newtonian physics problem. So go out there and implement physics fearlessly. Anyway, that's it for this whirlwind of an episode. I'm definitely biased since I did almost go to grad school for this stuff, but I really enjoy calculus and analysis, which is the theory behind it. If you end up using calculus in your game and feel like sharing it, I'd love to see how you guys use it, and I'd love to share it with this channel. The next episode in this math series is probability, and I might roll fuzzy logic in there as well. I'm still deciding. As always, thank you for watching. I appreciate your time, and I hope you have a good day. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. I release videos every two weeks, so if you want to follow along with this math series or my devlogs, please subscribe. If you want to leave a comment, I will be more than happy to get it. I don't bite. I post what I bake on Twitter when I do, so you can follow me there. And speaking of baking, let's get to it. All right, well, back to sourdough, as you can see. And, um, you know, I just made some nice two lows. I've been... Uh, Baking all kind of stuff that isn't sourdough. I had to make sure I could still do it. And as you can see, uh, they turned out really well. Uh, I got nice ears on them. Oh, and you can spy my Chemex in the background there. But yeah, I got nice, nice ears on them. And, uh, you know, it's just, just a classic sourdough. And I got really good spread. Like, I'm surprised at how much it spread out i forget you know this this is i think the end of my strategic reserve so my memory is foggy um but let's i mean we can look at the cross section here and i i try to fancier you know i'm, I'm trying out portrait uh, i forgot when i was taking these portrait photos that they don't work well um for the video so my apologies uh but yeah i'm tried out portrait and um you know i got D I got a good crumb on them. Not my most vacuous. I think I just did 75% hydration. I, I That's, you know, my comfortable range. You know, it's not a really wet dough, so I don't have to, uh, I don't have to work it a lot. And, you know, it's not too low to make a good bread or a good sourdough, excuse me. 
So it's just that this was these two were just really comfortable loves, you know, just getting back into the swing of things, essentially. And they they I mean they look good. They look good. The ears are nice. It's a good look and it's a good bread. And I'm gonna leave it there for this video. The yeast in the air is free. You should make your own bread. It tastes good and you know, it's good for you, it makes a great gift. Anyway, I appreciate you hanging around and see you next time.